Alright guys, BLM here, back with a new video. In this video, I'm back talking about the Life is Strange series, and here, around the one year anniversary of the third main installment in the series, I will be talking about Life is Strange, True Colors. And I really did want to do a spoiler review of this game around the time that it came out, but I didn't get around to playing it until a couple months after its release. And considering how busy I already was with certain other videos at the time, I just really didn't have the time to make this video then. But here, around a year later, I finally have time to talk about it in depth here. I mean, Life is Strange is a series I do have a rocky relationship with nowadays, where I absolutely love the first game, despite its flaws. But I haven't really liked any other game in the series since then, I mean, including Before the Storm, which is a game I actually really hate that just so happened to be the last game that this game's developers worked on. So that's a major reason why I was very hesitant coming into this game, though I did come out of it pleasantly surprised. I mean, to me, both Before the Storm and Life is Strange 2 lacked a certain charm that the original game had. And while I do think the approaches to storytelling between this game and the original game is slightly different with this being less plot heavy and being more of a character study of the character of Alex Chen, I did still really enjoy my experience with this game, with many elements of this game reminding me of that of the original. Now with this being a mostly narrative based experience, I do feel like the best way to talk about this game would be to run through the game from beginning to end, talking about my opinions along the way, and I will also be talking about the Wavelengths DLC at the end of the video as well. But again, let's just jump right into it. Let's start talking about Chapter 1, Side A, which starts with the scene of Alex Chen, the new main protagonist, having an exit interview with Dr. Lin as she is on her way to leave her foster home to live with her long-lost brother Gabe in Haven Springs, really setting up the initial premise of the story. I actually really like this first scene here. I mean, it is really well acted and animated, where even something like how Alex's eyes are moving really just conveys the way that Alex is feeling in this scene and really just sets up Alex's arc, where you can clearly tell that she looks at her powers of being able to tap into other people's emotions as a curse and we spend the entire game using her powers to do good around the town of Haven Springs and it is an arc that I did find very satisfying by the end of it. Afterwards we do arrive in Haven Springs which I will say I absolutely adore the setting of this game where this town just really feels like its own character in the game having a distinct vibe and tone while also being a setting that has a major impact on Alex's character moving forward. And I do find this to be a stronger setting than Arcadia Bay from the original games and an element of that is how Haven Springs essentially acts as its own like mini open world that you constantly go back to throughout the game allowing you to go to the same locales over and over again, making it feel like a living and breathing world, unlike Arcadia Bay, which was a lot more broken up by loading screens, and you weren't as free to explore those areas. And really just overall, I do feel like this game is able to create a much more immersive setting than the original game. But eventually we do meet up with Gabe, Alex's brother, and most of this episode does revolve around Alex's interactions with him, while also introducing us to all the other characters and plot lines that will become important in future chapters. But I did really like Gabe and his interactions with Alex here that, again, like in every other game in the series, can have some really cringy dialogue, but it did really feel heartwarming to see this brother and sister rebuild their relationship. And again, I will commend both of the actors of Alex and Gabe for doing a pretty good job in the portrayals of their characters during these scenes. Now, after their meetup, we do get introduced to a bevy of characters on the way to Gabe's apartment. We do stop by the flower shop where outside... We do meet Eleanor, who owns a store there. Again, realistically, not super important of a character. So I did find it strange that she's the first one we're introduced to. But we do also end up meeting her granddaughter, Riley, who is a character I really liked, though I do feel like most of the interactions you have with her are optional, which kind of lessen the impact of her character, where I mean, realistically, she is just a side character that doesn't have that much importance to play in the main story. But this scene does really set up the relationship between Gabe and Riley that does become a major source of conflict with Mac later on. We do meet Ethan, the son of Gabe's girlfriend, who is a character that can come off as annoying, being this pretty typical kid character that ends up causing trouble for the protagonist. But I will say that again, like, I really like how Ethan was portrayed in this game. Again, another character that had really vivid facial animations. And I did really like being able to read the emotions on his face, especially during that initial meeting with Alex where they nerd out about comics and you could just see the joy that comes on his face from doing so. 
but this is where we find out that he plans on exploring the mines outside town, despite the fact that a blast is supposedly going off later that night, which does lead us to our first major decision in the game of whether or not to rat him out to Gabe. Though realistically, this is a choice that doesn't really lead to any real changes as the same events end up occurring, though if you do tell Gabe, I do find it really dumb that he just still allows Ethan to leave and go off on his own as that just really opens it up for him to still go to the mines, which he obviously ends up doing. After this, we do end up going to the record store where we do end up meeting two other major characters here, the first being Steph, who runs the store and is also a local DJ, who is also a character from Life is Strange Before the Storm. And while Steph is probably the most prone to being the one with the cringiest dialogue, I, I do really like Steph in this game. With her relationship with Alex reminding me of Chloe's with Max, but really without all of the unlikable parts of Chloe's character. But again, the fact that they brought her back from Before Storm was such a strange concept to me where it really did feel random, where like I feel like she's a character I didn't have much of an opinion of from that original game. But again, here I do find her to be pretty likable and obviously more notable considering how much bigger of a role she has here. Though I will say that I do feel like the story feels pretty heavy handed and how blatant the story was written for you to choose to romance Steph with her and Alex's first interaction here feeling way more impactful than the other romance option and the next person that we end up meeting in Ryan, Gabe's best friend, who also comes off as like well here as well with him helping Alex find a gift for Gabe, though I did find it weird how he's even in the record store to begin with, with considering he isn't an employee and he mentions that the store is closed and he's there to pick up a CD of bird calls and all this just felt really weird. Now I know it plays into his quirks as a character, that he's like this park ranger, but I, I really just don't get why they didn't just make him a co-worker of Steph. I feel like that would have made more sense and also like his role as a park ranger like doesn't end up mattering to the story so again like I, I just really don't get why they made this decision here but this is when we get our first actual bit of gameplay here where Alex does have to find the hold list to find out which record to buy for Gabe and along the way we have to move Steph's cat Valkyrie who is sitting on the list which felt ridiculous but again this is very life is strange but it's here where we do first see Alex's reactions to other people emotions, particularly anger, where Steph comes out of her booth angry at the person she's on the phone with, which we later find out is due to her organizing a LARP, which just again felt dumb. But it's also here for the first time that we hear about Mac really wanting to talk to Gabe, which again, I wonder if that's going to be important later in the story. Afterwards, we do meet Jed, Ryan's father, and also Gabe's boss, who does instantly come off as really likable here, but I always felt like there was something off about him especially with these scenes of him at the bar where he has this like really bright red light shining down on him which to me felt like foreshadowing that he was going to be an antagonist but then we get to Gabe's apartment where we do see this really endearing scene of Gabe giving his apartment to Alex as he plans on moving in with Charlotte and also we get this scene of the two rocking out to the record that Alex bought for him and again this is a really ridiculous like air guitaring scene that gets even more ridiculous if you have the streaming mode turned on that takes out all the licensed music that makes this one of the weirdest scenes I've ever seen in all of gaming like it's so bizarre and it's like really clear that the game was not meant to be played in streaming mode as the silence during these scenes just make it really weird to see and also just in general licensed music does play a major factor into the identity of Life is Strange and have all that licensed music gone is a really suboptimal way to be playing the game, especially considering one of the things I think Life is Strange does best is selecting the right songs to impact you in the right ways, where some of my favorite scenes in the entire series are greatly booned by the music choice within them. But eventually, Gabe and Alex are interrupted by the appearance of Mac, who comes in irate at Gabe for supposedly sleeping with his girlfriend Riley and starts beating him up, which leads to us once again seeing Alex's reaction to anger, seeming to absorb it and use it against Mac, proceeding to beat him up and in the process accidentally hits Gabe as well, which leads to some awkwardness now between her and Gabe. But with this scene, I really did think that her reactions to anger was going to play a major impact in her backstory, particularly in her relationship with her dad, who we do hear her talk negatively about, but to be honest, it doesn't actually end up mattering too much down the road. But we do follow this up with seeing Alex unpack after suffering 
the ramifications of her attacking Mac and hurting Gabe that does lead to her finding a guitar that Gabe intended to be as a gift, leading to her singing Creep by Radiohead, which did feel like a really fitting song for this scene considering the circumstances. And I did really like the vulnerability that Alex's character exudes during this scene. Afterwards, we go downstairs to the Black Lantern bar, where we do get introduced to Charlotte, Gabe's girlfriend, who does make a solid first impression here, though I do feel like as the game goes on, she becomes less and less likable. We do see Gabe leave to get patched up, and while doing so, Jed asks Alex to cover his shift, so we do spend the next scene helping out at the bar with three tasks in particular. We first get to check up on Steph, where most of their interactions are optional here, but if you do choose to do them, it does further bond these two characters. We do also have to get orders from a table introducing us to two other new characters in Ducky and Diane. And I do find this to be kind of bizarre as these two characters have nothing to do with each other other than the fact that they're just randomly eating together for this one scene. It really just feels like these were the other two characters that we need introducing to and they didn't really have a good way to do it so we're like screw it let's put them all at one table but ducky is probably one of the more fun side characters to me being this eccentric older man that does have some humorous content while he's there diane has a bit of a strange presence here though we do learn that she works for typhon mining the antagonistic corporation in this game to which diane ends up becoming the figurehead for the company moving forward in the story but here she does get a pleasant enough introduction the one where like i was just kind of hesitant about her character even from the beginning here the final task here is cleaning up a table in the back which leads us interacting with mac who wants us to lie for him to riley which leads to us getting the choice of whether or not to do so which i do find humorous how this sole decision decides the entire fate of mac and riley's relationship where if you do tell her the truth they break up permanently while if you lie to her it leads to them staying together until the end of the game and realistically like mac and riley should definitely break up right i mean considering the fact of how many red flags there are in their relationship from riley clearly not being happy to mac being constantly worried of her cheating on him it's like they very clearly should break up though i will say that i did cover for him in my first playthrough now after the scene you do get introduced to pike the local sheriff who does have an awkward introduction with him pretending to arrest alex which seems like a very reckless thing to do and also just again like a very awkward way to introduce yourself to someone else but whatever Pike is a fine character. I think he is probably underutilized in the story. And I do think his likability is probably affected by a certain choice later in the game. Now afterwards, Gabe does return and you end up talking to him on the rooftop where Alex and Gabe do repair their relationship and you are given the choice of telling him about your powers, which just felt like the right thing to do here, which through doing so, we do have Gabe trying to convince her that her powers are a gift, not a curse as she perceives them to be which again, very much plays into her arc after this episode. We do also eventually learn that Ethan has gone missing, leading to us investigating the mines, where we do learn that Jed is considered a local hero due to an incident that happened at the mines years ago. And this, again, very much felt sketchy to me, even on my first playthrough, where I it really did convince me that Jed was in on the later conspiracy. But while at the mine, we do find out that the comic that Ethan has been writing is conveniently inspired by his experiences near the mine. This does lead to a bit of a puzzle section where you have to retrace his steps, but eventually we do find him stuck on the other side of a chasm, leading to Alex having to cross it in order to save him, which ends up being a pretty impactful moment for Alex's character here, with it pretty much being the first time that Alex uses her powers for good which becomes a central plot point moving forward. But Alex ends up absorbing Ethan's fear and overcomes his fear in order to rescue him, but immediately afterwards, the blast does go off, despite Gabe having earlier called to tell them of the situation, and the blast ends up knocking Gabe off, leading to Ryan having to cut his safety rope in order to save Alex here. Really, all this just felt very abrupt. Now, again, I was expecting Gabe to die, as they literally spoiled that in the trailers, and I do like the concept of him dying as a way to propel Alex's character, but I just don't love the execution of this scene. And again, it really comes off as ridiculous to me. When I first saw it, they just see him get knocked over. It felt very slapsticky to me, but... I mean, conceptually, this is a great way to end chapter one and did make me pretty excited to see what was coming moving forward. Well, with that, let's move on to chapter two, Lanterns, which was an episode that I really liked how it was structured. 
where the entire episode does revolve around Alex helping the citizens of Haven Springs as they mourn Gabe's death, which really progresses her character and her realizing how special her powers make her. I do also like how the episode begins and ends with events revolving around Gabe's death with both of them having radically different tones due to the actions of Alex over the course of this episode. But in this first scene, we have everyone being sad or angry with Ryan picking a fight with Mac over Gabe's death due to Mac lying about not having received Gabe's call earlier. But everything eventually turns on Ryan where talk turns to him being the one to actually kill Gabe due to him cutting the rope. And I just love how Ryan says, I'm not the one that killed him only for Mac to respond with his really killer comeback of, aren't you though? And again, that line just always makes me laugh, but this arguing and the anger led to Alex leaving the wake with Steph following her, where we do get our first scene of Alex helping someone in this episode, where she ends up playing foosball with Steph in order to cheer her up, as it gives her positive memories of Gabe. And I will say that I do hate the foosball mini game on PS5. I, mean, I simply just don't like how it controls, and this section does go on for far too long as you are forced to play three games here. But again, narratively, I do like the significance of it. The main story then takes us to the flower shop to look for Mac, and we don't find him there as, again, that would be too easy. But while there, we do find Eleanor, who we find out is suffering from memory loss, and through that, we have to end up helping her remember what she was doing, which again shows Alex using her powers for good. Though at the end of this section, we do get another decision of whether or not to tell Eleanor about Gabe's death, as she clearly doesn't remember it. And really this choice doesn't matter that much, but I never really got what actually is the moral response here. As I do feel like if you tell her, like yes, you're telling her the truth, but you're also telling her a really sad and depressing truth. Well, if you lie to her, at least you're keeping her happy. So yeah, I just don't know exactly what is supposed to be the correct moral decision there. But again, doesn't really matter. Now, along the main road during this section, there's a lot of optional content that if you do skip, you are essentially skipping on a lot of character interactions that obviously don't play into the main story, but are good moments to expand upon some of these characters that aren't utilized as much. I mean, you can find Ethan and learn about the guilt that he feels over Gabe's death. You can find Pike and tell him about your suspicions of Mac. You can visit Charlotte at the dispensary where you learn that she was offered a deal from Typhon to remain silent in exchange for money, and you can convince her on what to do with it. You can also return to the record store and help Steph prepare for the LARP that ends up happening in the next chapter. So again, all this feels like really strong side content, but realistically, the only person you actually have to talk to is Riley, who, through reading her emotions, you can make her open up about how sketchy Mac has been, and afterwards, you can find Mac at the bridge, where you do find out that he did tell Typhon about the Ethan situation, but they decided to not listen to him and are now threatening him to remain silent. And this is where we get another choice on whether or not to take Mac's fear from him. And for me, again, like obviously taking the fear from him feels like the right thing to do. I, I, I do feel like this is the outcome that fits Alex's character and her arc moving forward. As again, with her powers being that of reading emotions and having empathy for other characters, for her to just say no to helping people in situations like this would just feel really bizarre. But afterwards, we do end up meeting up with Ryan for another sequence of helping him where we do turn his anger into joy. And this, once again, feels very indicative of the story of this episode. While also seeming to be the point where Alex truly realizes the good that can come from her powers, again really progressing her story arc. And following this scene, the episode ends with the town raising lanterns in memory of Gabe. And here we do see Alex finally being able to talk about Gabe's death. Again, progression from where she was at the beginning of the episode where she couldn't talk during his wake. And also to see all the people that were sad and angry at the beginning of the episode now fill the joy due to the actions of Alex over the course of this episode, again, feels very impactful from a narrative standpoint. But at the tail end of the episode, we do see that the only person not filled with joy at this ceremony is Diane, who is instead filled with fear. Again, making it clear that she is hiding something, which leads us to chapter three, Monster or Mortal, which actually takes place weeks after the ending of chapter two, which I will say, I do find it kind of underwhelming how this game was structured, where something I did love about the original game was how it took place over five days, each episode covering the events of one day. While the story here just feels like it's all over the place, and it feels kind of unnecessary, as I feel like they could have easily 
had this taken place over the course of five days and nothing major would have changed. So again, that's something I wish they did, but obviously they don't do it here. But as for the chapter itself, we do start off with Alex now wanting to investigate Gabe's death and to do so plans on getting information from Diane. And here we instantly see that Alex, Ryan, and Steph are now very close, being bonded by their quest to find out the truth and end up plotting together in order to figure out how to get the info from Diane. And I did really like this scene where we hear out Ryan and Steph's plans and both of their plans are just to seduce Diane, which just felt ridiculous, but also, again, kind of humorous. But, I mean, this is something that, again, feels like a callback to the original game. I really do like this investigation into Gabe's death. Again, it reminded me of the investigation to Rachel Amber's death, which did make me feel a bit nostalgic while playing through these next few chapters. But eventually we do end up stealing Diane's USB drive and we do recruit Riley to help hack into it. But in the meantime, we do spend most of this episode playing in Steph's LARP, which she organizes in order to cheer Ethan up and we go alongside him in this pseudo turn-based RPG. And I really love this section. I mean, yes, it's very cheesy, but again, it knows that it's cheesy. And to me, this section really works in a multitude of ways, still keeping the tone of Life is Strange while progressing Alex's character with her again, helping out Ethan, trying to get him to get over Gabe's death here and also providing a really fun gameplay experience with them building this turn-based combat system just for this section of the game. And I also just love how open this section is as well, where you are given the goal of finding these three soul jewels, and you have a number of ways to get them. And along the way, you can find or buy scrolls that you can use as items during battle. I mean, you can even find items that allow you to skip certain boss battles in this section and you can also interact with a bevy of characters in this LARP and like all this is just again it's pretty fun I, I really do adore this section of the game despite how ridiculous it seems though interestingly this section does end with Jed turning out to be the main antagonist that again felt like foreshadowing now afterwards we do get this really awkward scene with Charlotte where you see that she is filled with anger holding resentment at Alex Gabe, Ryan, and even her own son in Ethan for how they have ruined her life. And I did find this to be pretty ridiculous. I did feel like this was a pretty negative turn for her character. Though again, I, I do get it. Again, she is supposed to be grieving. She's upset that her loved one is gone and it's essentially her son's fault for his death. But again, I just felt like this was a pretty bad look for her character. But once again, you do have the option of taking this anger from her. But something I do find strange is that it does seem like doing so actually has negative ramifications in the story moving forward. I mean, there's an immediate ramification being that taking your anger causes you to lash out at Steph and Ryan in the next scene that leads to them leaving during your investigation. Even though that doesn't end up amounting to much, again, it is still a bit of a negative turn there. But you taking your anger also causes her to not support you at the end of the game, which, which also feels like a weird decision for them to make, as you would think it would be the opposite, but whatever. But again, this episode does end with us looking at the USB drive and learning that the blast that killed Gabe wasn't stopped in order to cover a second blast that happened at the same time as Typhon is clearly trying to hide something with that second blast. Again, adding to the mystery here though, I did find this cliffhanger to be pretty abrupt and I found it to be a kind of awkward end to the episode here. Well, let's move on to chapter four, Flicker, which starts off with the Spring Festival, which had been foreshadowed since chapter one. And in many ways, this did have a similar role in the story to that of the end of the world party from Life is Strange 1, being the final bit of downtime before the end stretch of the story that does act as a bit of a farewell to some of the minor characters of the story, like Riley, Eleanor, Charlotte, and Ducky, with Ducky getting this pretty nice scene where you help him get over his wife's death and we have this really nice dance with him that again felt like a good character moment for Alex. But as for the main story, this is where you do get to select which of Steph or Ryan you are going to romance. And again, to me, the story does feel more complete going for Steph. I think their relationship makes more sense narratively and the future scenes with them feel more impactful to me than that of Ryan's, especially considering some of the events later in the story don't really make it make sense that Alex and Ryan end up in a relationship. But this does lead to another pretty impactful moment for Alex's character where Steph and Ryan force Alex to sing in front of the entire festival, which again felt like the final evolution for 
Alex's character arc, where she has now found her calling, found this home that she has never been able to have throughout her entire childhood. But following this, we do end up meeting up with our love interest on the rooftop, which again, the Steph version of this scene makes so much more sense to me. While I do feel like the Ryan scene just comes off as pretty awkward, Though I did like the contrast between the two here with Steph trying to convince Alex to go on the road, Ryan tries to convince her to stay in Haven Springs. But afterwards, we do end up meeting with Pike to give him the USB, again to take Typhon down, only for Pike to instead actually end up arresting us, leading to the interrogation where we are threatened with imprisonment for us and Steph and Ryan if we don't sign the affidavit. In here, we are given the option of signing it or taking Pike's fear, though again, this choice doesn't really end up mattering much outside of whether or not Pike sides with you at the final council, which is also a thing that doesn't matter. But after we are released, we do end up meeting with Jed, who reveals that he knows what Typhon is hiding and offers to take us there. And once we get to the mine, we get a scene very reminiscent of the Jefferson reveal from Life is Strange 1, where Jed pulls out his gun revealing that he is the person that threatened her and got her arrested and again this is a great reveal again i was expecting this it did feel pretty obvious to me by this point though i feel like a lot of that is just due to knowing how they handled jefferson in season one and this kind of feeling somewhat reminiscent of that though i do think him actually shooting alex causing her to fall down the mine did feel like a great way to end chapter four here really setting up the stakes for the final chapter and again leading us into chapter five side b which like the final episode of life is strange one does spend a lot of time in flashbacks or dream sequences and that's something i still don't like conceptually but i actually do think it was better handled here than it was in the original game as here it is used as a way to fully round out alex's character and we do start the chapter back in dr lynn's office a mirror of that first scene in the game but this time we do find out that it is a dream sequence and to escape it we need to fix alex's guitar I, I do like that it mirrors the beginning of the game, but outside of that, I feel like this is probably actually my least favorite of these flashback slash stream sequences, as this feels like the least important of the bunch. Though after this, we do get, again get some flashbacks that do round out Alex's character, though I do think they are also portrayed a bit strangely here, where Alex and Gabe are supposed to be younger, they're supposed to be kids here, though we do see the younger version of their characters in their adult bodies, and I just found that to be pretty jarring, and just felt like it was developers being cheap here, not really wanting to render younger versions of these characters. And something else I didn't like about this is the fact that you have to play these sections twice to get the real context of the situation for some reason. Again, that just felt kind of unnecessary as why didn't they just do it the first time? But first we do see Alex in the hospital as her mother is on her deathbed, where we do learn that her mother tasked her with keeping the family together, which she ends up failing to do so in the very next scene, where we fast forward to see her dad and Gabe continuously getting into fights until all comes to a head, where during a fight with her dad, he accidentally hits Alex in a similar way to how Alex accidentally hit Gabe earlier in the game. And this causes him to decide to abandon them, leading to us fast forwarding once again to seeing Alex in foster care, where we had already learned that she was considered a troubled child, due to her gang in constant fights, but we do also learn here that this caused her to never get adopted, and through that again, never seem to actually have a home. And these are all really strong flashbacks. Again, I would have personally chosen to convey them a bit differently, but I do really like how they give us the greater context on Alex's character, which is so integral to this game. Again, we learn all of the hardships that she's been through in her life, and through this, kind of also learn why she is able to have the level of empathy for others that she has. But after this, we do awaken at the bottom of the mine where we slowly walk through it. And this is where we learned why Jed covered everything up. We do learn that his decisions as a foreman led to the death of a number of miners in this mine. And Typhon is trying to cover it up making him look like a hero instead, but also through this we do get the revelation that one of the miners that died just so happened to be Alex's father. That instantly to me I found to be extremely convenient and kind of melodramatic, but in retrospect now looking at it as the reason why Gabe even goes to Haven Springs to begin with. 
was the search for their father, it does really rectify the plot convenience that is there. Though it is definitely a turn that I was not expecting the story to take here. But afterwards, Alex does escape and ends up showing up at the Black Lantern conveniently in the middle of a town council, where we do reveal that Jed and Diane are covering up what happened in the mine And here, whether or not certain members of the council believe your story is determined on your decisions throughout the game. Though again, at the end of the day, it really doesn't end up mattering who sides with you and who doesn't, as no matter what, you end up using your powers on Jed anyway to make him give a confession, which ends up ending the conflict here. Though I did find the final dialogue choice to be pretty interesting here, where you can choose to forgive him or condemn him. And I do feel like condemning him kind of goes against the story here. Again, like forgiving him to me really fits Alex's character of being this empathetic figure, really rounding out her arc in the story here. But to do the opposite doesn't really align with what the story seems to be about. But following this, the rest of the Typhon storyline is kind of just wrapped up while Alex is laying there listening to the radio, where we find out that the Typhon CEO is stepping down and Jed has been arrested. And I do think this wraps up that storyline in kind of an underwhelming way, or at least that's how I thought of it as first. Though I do think this kind of made me recontextualize the entire narrative here. And again, really brings me to what I mentioned earlier, that one of the major differences between this and the original Life is Strange, where I do feel like the original Life is Strange was so focused on the plot where that's simply not the focus of this game. I mean, this game is much more focused on the character of Alex and how she ends up affecting the people around her. Really, the main plot isn't that focused on for most of the game. I mean, while chapter one is very plot heavy, chapters two, three, and four are more so focused on Alex helping people and her relationships with those people rather than progressing the main story. And again, chapter five here is more so focused on rounding out Alex's backstory until the tail end of the game where yes, it does become a bit more plot heavy, but again, considering they don't even bother to properly conclude the Typhon storyline here, it really makes you realize that again, it doesn't matter. Like it really doesn't matter what the plot of this game is because they're more so just trying to focus on the character of Alex Chen. And really that is the make or break for this game to me is how much you like Alex as a character. And to me again, I think Alex is the most complex Life is Strange protagonist the series has seen up to this point. I think she's clearly the best written character, which again does greatly boon this game because without it, I don't think this game would be nearly as good as it is. But with that, we do get our final few scenes where we do get the final meetup with our love interest that really just plays off of that rooftop scene. Though with Ryan, again, it just doesn't really fit. To me, after Ryan doesn't end up siding with you at the council, at least through my playthroughs of the game. So it just feels weird that you would, one, end up being with him. And yes, forgiving him makes sense. Again, that would be the Alex thing to do. It also, like, just feels awkward that that is... Something that literally happened less than 10 minutes before this scene starts. Though I do also find it funny that, again, like, while it doesn't fit with the themes of the story, you you can just straight up turn Ryan down, which does feel humorous to me. But afterwards, we do get to the final scene in the game where Alex is sitting on the rooftop talking to her illusion of Gabe. And here we get the final choice in the game of staying in Haven or deciding to travel. And I do think both of these choices work well for the story here and doesn't really have as much of an impact on the narrative as the final choice of Life is Strange 1. As either way, Alex is able to help people and play music as she wants in both outcomes. Now, In terms of the concept of her finding her home, I do feel like the Haven ending does feel more all-encompassing, while the adventure ending is a bit more awkward if Alex doesn't have a love interest at the end, because you can say that, okay, Steph or Ryan, like, that is her home. But when she's just alone on the road, I feel like it's a bit more awkward. But either way, I do think this game does a pretty good job at servicing Alex's character either way, to where, while I don't think it's the most dynamic ending possible, Both of these endings do satisfy her character's arc over the course of the game that truly allows True Colors here to end on a high note. And again, overall, I do really enjoy the main campaign of Life is Strange True Colors. In many ways, it did remind me of the love that I had for the original game. And again, while the point of the stories that are told within both these games is slightly different, I do hold both games in similar regard. 
Now, I will say that my nostalgia for the original game probably does overtake this one if I were to pick one as my favorite, but I do think this is clearly the best written game in the series, and in general, I would have to say this is probably technically the best Life is Strange game. And with that, that is the main game. Before we end here, I do still want to talk about the DLC, Wavelengths, which allows us to play as Steph during the year leading up to the start of the main game, where we do spend the entire DLC in the record store as we go through the seasons, getting more insight on Steph as a character, which I did enjoy that element of it. But for the most part, this DLC does feel completely superfluous and mostly just feels like fan service. Now, this DLC does have unique gameplay elements where you do get to manage the radio booth, which includes you like reading ads and picking up phone calls. Also, bizarrely, this game does have a Tinder knockoff where you can have conversations with a number of characters that you never actually meet. And while it's cool that they took the time to write all these conversations, most of them don't end up leading to much. But again, narratively, we do get to see what happens to Steph over the course of this year. We see Steph's first day at the store, where she awkwardly gets accustomed to her job, having a number of mishaps, including her admitting to not being qualified for the job while being on air. We also get the setup of how she ends up finding Valkyrie, obviously her cat, moving forward. But we then fast forward to summertime, where not much actually happens narratively here, though we do get some cool fan service through Steph remembering some conversations with Chloe. We then fast forward to Halloween, where this is probably where most of the more notable fan service ends up happening, where depending on if you saved Arcadia Bay in Life of Strange 1 or not, Steph ends up having a slightly different background here, with her either being traumatized from the entire Jefferson situation, or from the destruction of her hometown. But either way, this plays into her backstory here, where through her trauma, she has stopped talking to Mikey, her best friend from before the storm. But here she does end up calling him, and they play a tabletop game over a call. And I did think this was a pretty cool scene to see them bring back the original voice actor of Mikey as well. And we do see Steph work through her issues there. The final playable section here takes place in winter, where she gets a call from Gabe telling her, that he is going to see a family member that he has not seen in a long time, obviously setting up the events of the main game. That's later getting the final scene in the game, which shows us Steph's perspective of the scene where Alex and Steph meet for the first time, again, feeling like a good full circle moment to end the DLC with. I, I do like elements of this DLC, the focus on Steph's character, her background, the fan service within it, but really, it's simply not that notable of a DLC and really doesn't add much to the story. But at least it doesn't take anything away either. Again, it's mostly just something that's there. But with that, I mean, those are essentially my thoughts on the entirety of Life is Strange True Colors. And with that, I have now talked in detail about this game and the original game. Now, the five-year anniversary of Before the Storm is coming up, and I will be doing a retrospective of that as well. And hopefully, eventually, I'll get around to doing a video on Life is Strange 2 so I can really just wrap up this series of in-depth retrospectives in a bow obviously that is for down the road but for now that is the video thank you for watching